In the medieval world, metal was the backbone of power. Iron forged swords, bronze cast bells, and gold and silver sustained empires. Yet among these treasures, there were metals so rare that even kings had only heard their names whispered in rumour. They came from lands of legend, bound to magic, medicine, and faith. So, what was the rarest metal of the Middle Ages, and what made it a symbol not only of mystery but of humanity's endless hunger to reach beyond the limits of the earth? Metal was the silent force that shaped the medieval world. From the clang of blacksmith hammers to the toll of cathedral bells, every sound of progress came from the furnace. Iron, copper, bronze, and silver. They were more than materials. They were civilization itself. In villages, blacksmiths were second only to priests in importance. They turned ore into ploughs that fed kingdoms, nails that held cathedrals together, and swords that defended borders. A single forge could mean survival or ruin for an entire town. But beyond their practical value, metals carried a spiritual and symbolic weight. Medieval people believed that metals grew in the earth like living things, that gold was mature metal, while lead was young. This belief tied metallurgy to alchemy, and alchemy to the divine. To master metal was to understand the will of God hidden in stone. Yet, while common metals filled every corner of life, whispers persisted of stranger elements, metals that glowed unnaturally, that moved like liquid, or fell from the heavens. These were not just materials, they were mysteries. The search for them would drive explorers, merchants, and mystics alike across deserts and oceans. The story of the rarest metal in the medieval world begins not in a mine or a forge, but in human imagination, the idea that something beyond gold might exist, and that it could change everything. Gold shimmered across the known world from African mines to Byzantine vaults. It adorned crowns, chalices, and the relics of saints. To medieval minds, gold was the colour of eternity, incorruptible, untarnished, divine. But it was not truly rare. Caravans brought it from Mali and Nubia, ships from the east carried it to Venice and Genoa. Gold's power came from belief, not scarcity. It symbolised heaven, purity, and divine favour. Rulers hoarded it not just to show wealth, but to prove legitimacy. Silver, too, flowed through medieval veins. It was the lifeblood of trade, minted into coins that connected peasants to popes. Mines in Saxony, Bohemia and England produced enough to feed empires. Cathedrals lined their altars with it, seeing in its pale gleam the light of the Virgin. But in truth, both gold and silver were victims of their own fame. They dazzled the world but hid the real wonders, metals that could not be easily melted, traded or mined. While nobles measured wealth in weight, scholars and alchemists searched for metals with secrets instead of shine. To find what was truly rare, one had to look beyond the treasuries of kings, to the hidden corners of the earth, and to the forgotten pages of alchemical manuscripts that spoke of metals the world was not ready to understand. Iron and copper were the beating heart of everyday medieval life. They lacked the luster of gold or the purity of silver, yet no kingdom could survive without them. These were the metals of the common man, humble, indispensable, and everywhere. Iron gave birth to the age of fortresses and fields. From plowshares to chainmail, it was both the farmer's tool and the knight's armour. Medieval blacksmiths turned raw ore into life itself, their forges burning in nearly every village. The sound of hammer on anvil was the pulse of progress, echoing through valleys and castles alike. Copper, softer but more forgiving, flowed into countless crafts. It became church bells that called the faithful to prayer and cauldrons that fed entire families. When mixed with tin, it formed bronze, a metal of resilience used in weapons, statues and sacred art. These metals were abundant but never ordinary. They linked all social classes. Kings needed iron for their armies, peasants needed it for their ploughs, and priests needed it for their bells. They were democratic in a world ruled by hierarchy. Still, their very abundance stripped them of mystique. No alchemist sought the secrets of iron. No legend told of copper falling from the sky. To find the truly rare, one had to venture into the realm of metals that defied nature those that shimmered, moved, or came from beyond the earth itself. Tin, though modest in appearance, held immense strategic value during the Middle Ages. Without tin, there would be no bronze, and without bronze, the tools and bells that shaped Europe's culture and warfare would not exist. 
the British Isles, particularly Cornwall, became the tin capital of the world. Traders crossed dangerous seas to obtain this pale metal, which was essential for casting bronze weapons, armour and church relics. To control tin was to control an entire supply chain, stretching from the mines of England to the workshops of Italy and the markets of Constantinople. Unlike gold or silver, tin did not inspire poetry or worship. It corroded easily and lacked beauty. Yet it was the quiet engine of medieval innovation. It was mixed, melted and reimagined. Proof that value was not always tied to rarity. Still, even with its importance, tin was far from the rarest of metals. It was known, mined and traded openly. The world understood it. But the medieval mind was drawn not only to what could be used, but to what could not be explained. The metals that resisted melting, that defied fire itself, that seemed touched by celestial hands. And soon, among those enigmas, another metal would appear. One that shimmered like liquid, moved like life itself, and terrified those who dared to touch it. Among all medieval metals, none captured the imagination quite like mercury, the quicksilver that moved as if alive. It flowed, shimmered, and refused to be held. To those who witnessed it for the first time, it seemed less a metal and more a spirit. Extracted mainly from the Almaden mines of Spain, mercury was exceedingly rare and perilous to handle. Miners inhaled its toxic vapours unknowingly, paying with their lives for the silver glow of the living metal. Yet despite its danger, it became the cornerstone of alchemy. Alchemists believed mercury was the essence of transformation, the bridge between life and death, matter and spirit. In illuminated manuscripts, mercury was drawn as a serpent or a divine tear. It was used in medicine to purge the body, in rituals to purify the soul, and in experiments that sought to turn base metals into gold. The shimmering metal seemed to hold the secret of creation itself. It was fluid, yet solid, reflective, yet elusive. For medieval thinkers, Mercury embodied contradiction, both poison and cure, sacred and profane. Its rarity was not only physical but symbolic. It was a glimpse into the hidden order of the world, a reminder that nature's strangest treasures came with the highest cost. Those who sought to master Mercury were not merely chasing wealth, they were challenging the limits of human understanding. Long before Europe understood what it was, platinum was already being worked by ancient hands. In the Islamic world and across pre-Columbian America, artisans stumbled upon a mysterious white metal, harder than silver and resistant to fire. But in the Middle Ages, such a material had no place. The furnaces of the time could not melt it, and so alchemists dismissed it as an impurity of gold. To them, platinum was a mistake of nature, a stubborn, defiant metal that refused transformation. When Spanish explorers later brought samples from the New World, they called it platina, meaning little silver a name that betrayed both ignorance and awe. To medieval metallurgists, it was worthless because it could not be altered. To modern science, it would become one of the rarest and most precious metals known. Platinum's story in the Middle Ages is one of invisibility, a rarity hidden in plain sight. It existed, yet it was forgotten, buried beneath the limits of technology and imagination. Unlike gold, which symbolised perfection, Platinum symbolised resistance, the metal that refused to obey. In this defiance, it became more than rare. It became prophetic, a symbol of a world waiting for knowledge to catch up with its mysteries, a silent witness to how much humanity still had to learn about the materials shaping its destiny. Hidden within the dark laboratories of monasteries, alchemists experimented with two strange metals, antimony and arsenic. These elements, obscure and dangerous, were believed to hold divine secrets. They were not used for coins or weapons, but for transformation of both matter and soul. Antimony, a silvery-grey mineral, fascinated alchemists because it seemed to purify whatever it touched. When melted, it shimmered with a peculiar light, almost like quicksilver but heavier, calmer. It appeared in sacred texts as the wolf of metals, said to devour base substances and release their hidden essence. In truth, it was toxic, but to the medieval mind, that only made it more powerful. Arsenic, its ghostly twin, was both medicine and poison. Used in small doses, it treated diseases. In excess, it killed silently. It gave glass a bright clarity and turned copper into gold-coloured alloys, deceiving the eye and fueling legends of transmutation. 
To the church, these experiments bordered on heresy. To the alchemists, they were a form of worship. Metals like antimony and arsenic blurred the line between science and sin, proof that the divine could be found in decay, that even death might contain revelation. For them, these metals were steps on the ladder to enlightenment, not ends in themselves. Rarity in this sense was not about scarcity. It was about secrecy. Among all metals, one stood apart, not born of the earth, but fallen from the heavens. Meteoritic iron was the rarest of all, a gift from the cosmos itself. To medieval minds, it was nothing less than a fragment of the divine. Only a few pieces existed, scattered across deserts and tundras. When shaped by human hands, they became relics rather than tools. Ancient blades forged from meteorite iron, like the dagger buried with Pharaoh Tutankhamun, were still whispered about in medieval chronicles as weapons of celestial power. Unlike earthly iron, this metal bore an unearthly pattern, a shimmering weave of nickel and steel that caught the light like stars trapped in stone. To blacksmiths it was nearly impossible to work with. To mystics it was proof that heaven had touched the forge. Some Islamic swords, according to legend, contained traces of this iron from the sky, granting them a supernatural sharpness. Crusaders who heard of such blades feared them as instruments of divine judgment. To possess such metal was to hold a piece of eternity, rare not because of its scarcity alone, but because it transcended the world itself. It was the bridge between mortal craft and cosmic mystery, a reminder that even in the age of iron and stone, humanity still looked upward, longing for fire that fell from the stars. When historians speak of the rarest metals of the Middle Ages, two names rise above all others. Mercury, the liquid mirror of life and death, and meteoritic iron, the celestial metal that defied the earth. Mercury was rare because of its danger. Only a handful of mines, such as Almaden in Spain, could produce it, and those who did often perished from its invisible fumes. It was a metal that punished curiosity, yet the more deadly it proved, the more men desired it. It symbolised change, the eternal dance between solid and liquid, mortal and divine. Meteoritic iron, by contrast, was rare not through peril but through origin. It could not be mined, only found. Gifts fallen from the sky. No alchemist could replicate it. No kingdom could monopolise it. It was beyond commerce, beyond control. Together, they formed two poles of human ambition. One represented transformation, the belief that man could master nature. The other, transcendence, the dream that something greater had once touched the world. In a sense, both metals were mirrors. Mercury reflected the restless mind of humanity, ever in motion. Meteoric iron reflected its yearning for eternity. Their rarity was not measured in ounces, but in meaning. In the medieval world, metals were not just the bones of civilization; They were the language of the human spirit. Gold spoke of power, silver of purity, iron of labor, and bronze of endurance. But mercury and meteoritic iron spoke of something deeper, the desire to cross boundaries that should not be crossed. For every blacksmith forging a plow, there was an alchemist trying to forge the soul. For every miner digging into the earth, there was a monk staring at the sky, believing that the rarest treasures did not lie below, but above. The rarest metal, then, was never truly about scarcity. It was about wonder, about the way humanity saw itself reflected in the mysteries of the natural world. Medieval people did not separate science from faith, or metal from meaning. To them, every vein of ore was a pulse of divine will, and every forge was a small imitation of creation itself. Perhaps that is why the story of the rarest metal is also the story of humanity's oldest hunger, the longing to turn the unknown into light, to find eternity in the shimmer of something that refuses to stay still.